Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Let's get into it with uh, big bank earnings, Carol Master. We got another big batch of earnings from the Wall Street banks, from Bank of America, Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs, all rallying at their highs today. B of A holding on to some of it, while Citi is selling off a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's definitely been bouncing around here. With a look at the quarter outlooks and the comps, back with us is Cheryl Pate. She's Senior Portfolio Manager at Angel Oak Capital Advisors. She joins us from Atlanta on this Bank Earnings Tuesday. Um, Cheryl, good to have you back with us. So some initial enthusiasm and even early in the trade when it comes to the big three reporting today it's playing out differently goldman just up about a quarter of a percent it was up 3.4 percent earlier in the session city was up nearly two percent at its highs today it's now down almost five percent b of a meantime was up about three and a half percent at its highs still holding on to a gain of about 1.2 percent walk us through uh the earnings from these big three what it says to you and how you think they did yeah, absolutely, and I'm happy to be back on. Um, and I think the stock action today would line up with, with how we think the earnings really came out. Um, I think we did have a preference for Bank of America into earnings, and I think we we got a lot of what we wanted. Um, there are certainly signs that the operating environment is becoming more positive. Um, they, they highlighted that they think they're at the inflection point on NIM, and, and that I think has been you know the key focus for a lot of investors when we hit that inflection point. Um, other than that, we also were positively encouraged by what we saw in consumer credit. The consumer continues to hold in well. We saw good trends on credit cards um, in terms of uh, some of the charge off data improving from the prior quarter. That lines up with what we've been seeing in the monthly data as well. Um, and then capital markets are strong too. Um, if we loop that back to to City, I think it it's still a longer tailed, more of a um, self help restructuring story to go there. But a lot of the similar trends played out. I would say they were more cautious on the NIM guidance and and guiding to flat. Although that's probably a little bit better than what uh, investors and analysts were expecting. Um, and to round it out with Goldman, I think, you know, it was a very strong quarter, capital markets um, across the board. I think there's still a little bit of question on, on the consumer division there. Um, but all in all, I think it's been a, a good start to earnings season. Hey, Cheryl, big picture. You mentioned the consumer a few times there. But if we, we take these three banks at, at, at what they said today, what's the picture of the American consumer they painted? And I know it's, it's, it's not monolithic. There's certainly some commentary from Bank of America about lower income consumers that differ from middle class and higher income consumers, but how would you characterize it taken together? Yeah, when we look at the consumer broadly, I do agree. I think we've seen um, really no weakness in terms of retail spending, particularly on the higher end, um, but still some pressures on a lower end, lower FICO type consumer, and that, that'll hit different um, banks and consumer finance companies differently based on their portfolios. But I think what we can see um, it is some credit normalization happening, um, but at a decelerating pace. So if, if we're moving into a rate cut environment and, and achieve a, lot, a soft landing, uh, we feel pretty good about um, the consumer here and, and you know keeping eyes on the lower end, but, but um, some of the positive tailwinds um, should be helpful there. Hey, Cheryl, when you look at um, the big banks overall, of course, uh, JP Morgan kicking off the earnings season on Friday. And when you look at the group and the comps, who is best in class? Is it JP Morgan in mm. your view? I, I do agree with that. I, I think you do see that, um, you know, there is a valuation premium that comes along with JP Morgan. And I do think it is deserved. Um, they've proven time and time again that, you know, that there really is this concept of, of the fortress balance sheet that, that has been talked about for years, um, but also they continue to deliver on, on sort of firing on all cylinders. So um, consistency and, and um, strength continues to play through there. Um, and we do think that uh, the, the premium valuation is deserving. Were you buying? What have you been buying or selling? I am curious, uh, coming off of earnings or heading into earnings or heading out of earnings? 
Yep, I, I would say um, we have been, um, we've been finding opportunities, I would say, on the debt side of oh. a lot of the uh, money center banks. We have been adding um, to positions in names like JP Morgan and Bank of America. Um, and we remain more cautious on the regional banks. Um, rate cuts could help the narrative there. Um, but at this point in the cycle, we have a preference for the large cap given diversification of the business model, upside from capital markets, and uh, consumer exposure. We should point out JP Morgan Chase, the first of Wall Street's six biggest banks to tap the U.S. investment grade bond market after reporting earnings, um, really setting the stage for a potential flood of issuance from the banking group overall. Um, JP Morgan selling the bonds in as many as four parts, according to person with knowledge uh, of the matter. So that talks about some of the debt, Cheryl, that, that you are suggesting and that may mm -hmm. be interesting. Hey, Cheryl, uh, any commentary or insight into deal making for the final quarter of the year and into, into next year? What uh, M&A will look like, what IPOs will look like, and, and of course, the fees associated with those for some of these banks? Yeah, I, I do think we are in sort of the early stages of the capital markets recovery. So we do expect continued strength coming out of uh, both investment banking and, and the trading businesses in the fourth quarter and, and certainly into 2025 as well. I think a little bit of um, relief on the rate side helps. Um, we're hearing that pipelines are strong. Um, and then even if we think about M&A within the banking sector specifically, um, we think there's a lot of reasons why that will increase over the next year or so um, as, as efficiency gains and, and cost saves remain um, a key focus for the sector. In terms of Citigroup, which we know is is been kind of changing in terms of strategy and Jane Frazier making a lot of moves. You know, one of our stories that's on the Bloomberg talks about how she um, has had to deny that the bank had a secret regulatory straitjacket and took repeated questions by analysts for her to be clear that U.S. regulators have not placed Citi under an asset cap, which has been one of the most feared and prohibitive penalties that we know regulators can place on U.S. lenders. She said, let me be crystal clear, we do not have an asset cap. We're not expecting any. Um, but what does that say that she had to say that so many times and the concerns about you know where Citi is going? Yeah, I, I think there is still some uncertainty as to um, the restructuring and, and what city looks like when, when we come through the other end of this. Um, I think the first answer on the analyst call was was a little evasive and, and you know, really was what was driving the need to be clear about that later. Um, but but to me, that signals there's there's still a lot of work to do in terms of execution on the strategy. Um, and, and it's, I think, going to take some time for investors to, to buy into it. Hey, Cheryl, you mentioned that uh, JP Morgan kind of stands out as a leader, at least thus far, when it comes to rounding out the earnings season. Give us an update or your view on who's at the other end of the pack right now. Which, which bank or which stock is lagging? Um, if we're sort of looking at who's come out thus far in, in sort of the larger cap world, um, you know, I, th I think I would say, you know, both City and Wells um, on the lower end. Now there's a lot of, you know, sort of regulatory self-help type narrative around both of those names. Um, but I think also in terms of, you know, forward guidance was a little less optimistic than what we're seeing at, at some of the other banks. Um, and just, you know, maybe some more room in terms of um, improving confidence and driving valuations higher. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a longer tail um, and there's some messiness around the numbers that, that um, you know, cause, cause some, uh, you know, varying views. Any indications in terms of the big bank earnings, what it tells you about kind of the U.S. economic outlook or even the global economy since these are global banks? Yeah, I, th I think um, most of the commentary, I, I would say, generally focused on on sort of domestic conditions. And um, I, I think it was a little bit more optimistic tone than last quarter. Um, I think, you know, capital markets rebound is helping a lot here, but also we got the rate cut pretty late in the third, uh, third quarter. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, been some benefit that's played through in terms of AOCI and capital levels. Uh, but I don't think we saw the full benefit really um, in the numbers yet. And, and that's sort of to come in terms of the operating environment. Um, and, and it seemed like a more opt optimistic tone, generally speaking. I think um, Jamie Dimon was probably the more, 
you know, not not to say negative, but more cautious on sort of the more global environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that could play into some of the more international business lines, but that still tends to be a smaller piece. It, the, the, the next year or so is really, I think, going to be driven off um, sort of the fundamentals of, of key banking businesses. Hey, Cheryl, uh, election <laughs> less than three weeks away at this point, three weeks away exactly. Um, certainly top of mind for us, uh, our editor-in-chief here at Bloomberg News, John Micklethwaite, just wrapping up an interview with uh, former President Donald Trump at the Economic Club of Chicago. Um, I'm thinking in your, in your seat, how are you thinking about the way that a Harris administration or another Trump administration would affect these big banks? Yeah, I, I think um, w when we sort of think about potential outcomes from the election, um, you know, the view the view from my seat would really be, um, you know, a, a Democratic win, I think, is status quo in terms of where we are, in terms of capital levels. Um, there's, you know, perhaps a faster path to getting the final details on uh, Basel III endgame. Um, and a Republican um, win, I think, would really maybe help advance some of the m and I was speaking about and, and sort of loosening some of the regulations around um, around combinations, but also speeding up the time of approvals, which has been a bit of a, um, you know, a lengthening process over the last few years. So um, sort of status quo to, to right. positive. Yeah. Cheryl, real quickly, though, um, Donald Trump did s tell John Micklethwaite when it comes to the Fed, I think that if you're um, oh, he said he, he thinks it's a fair game for a president to tell the head of the central bank how he thinks interest rates should change. If there is a second White House with Donald Trump in it and he plays around with the Fed, that's a problem, right? Real quickly, just got 15 seconds. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. I think the independence of the Fed is critical. All right, going to leave it there. Cheryl Pate, Senior Portfolio Manager at Angel O Capital Advisors. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week on TV, radio, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, the property market, it has started to stir again, bolstered in part by the Federal Reserve's first interest rate cut in more than four years. It's not, though, necessarily full steam ahead. As Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle reported recently with Natalie Wong, many parts of the commercial property market have started to hit a bottom, but offices remain an outlier. This is according to one specific real estate investment firm, BGO, which oversees him more than $83 billion. Here to talk more about that is Amy Price, president at the private commercial real estate firm BGO, along with Bloomberg News Markets correspondent Abigail Doolittle who follows and reports on the real estate space as well. They both join us here in the studio. Uh, Amy, I want to start with you and, and just get this idea from you that the property market has started to stir again. Is When we, when we hear that, when we see that, mm -hmm. what is the time period that's referring to? Is that referring to when we knew rates would get cut or when rates were actually cut? Yeah, it's a good place to start. I would say we will look back and see the latter half of 24 as that turning point for commercial real estate broadly. Now, as you pointed out, office is a bit of an exception to that. Um, and I think we started to see that even in anticipation of that first rate cut. We saw more liquidity in the market. We saw more activity both on the credit side and on the equity side. Um, but we're also seeing it now you know, into the fourth quarter of this year. Um, so yes, I'd say with the anticipation of rates having peaked, with the anticipation of you know, values having found their bottom mm. and starting to, to increase, again, office a little bit different, um, liquidity is returning to the market, and that's healthy. I want to ask you, in anticipation of rates going lower, I'm curious how important is it that rates actually continue to go lower a lot to have a dramatic difference and impact on real estate? Like, how sensitive? <laughs> and in terms of what the Fed does. Yeah, real estate from an income and yield perspective, it's quite sensitive. Right. Uh, and so I think certainly where interest rates level out and where they get to is very important. I would say the pace is less critical. Um, you know, as an investor in real estate, we are generally long-term investors. So right. we're really looking for yield and opportunity now, but we're measuring that also aligned with 
just the, the demand drivers that are longer term and that are kind of acyclical. So we're looking for both. Um, and so from an investor's perspective, you know, certainly how quickly rates adjust will, will drive velocity in the market, but longer term, it has less of an how impact. How much lower would you like to see it go, though? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd like to see it go. Yeah. But I mean, realistically, to really kind of get a jolt. Well, it, you know, listen, I think the jolt is probably, you know, more than 50 basis points, okay. right? Another 25, 50 is pr pr probably expected, more ordinary course. Again, question is the timing. Going beneath that, we'll start to see more of a jolt from what's already been baked into the market today. Right? So that's a pretty bold call, Amy, on the <laughs> idea that this last half of 2024 could be the bottom and what's been a pretty yeah. painful uh, cycle. So many people saying that it's going to take a long time to work out, work it out. But one one piece, as you were mentioning, office that's still in pain. I was talking to one of the top private credit guys uh, recently, and he was saying that while the rest of the market may be starting to recover, that office is so painful, it's almost acting like this big weight around the leg of real estate. Are you seeing that at all? And to what degree could it remain a problem into 2025, understanding that the bottom may be made? Right. So office is idiosyncratic this cycle, for sure. Uh, we're seeing the headwinds from return to office, you know, start to normalize the pendulum to kind of find its, I think it's equilibrium, but there's questions on the horizon about what does AI do for the future of office jobs, et cetera. So if you look forward in office, there's just, you know, a much murkier picture ahead. Um, and that is a bit of a weight against a diversified pool or a diversified strategy. So I think that's part of why we're seeing more interest in, you know, sometimes people refer to them as niche sectors, but specific strategies where you say, okay, I can invest into, you know, some of these sectors that, that are counter cyclical, right, but don't have the same headwinds as office. Does it eat into the dry powder though of say some of the big sovereign funds that are in office that they can't get out of it, so they, they just don't have the money to allocate to these other sectors you're talking about? There is definitely capital tied up in office that would like to be out of office. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same How time, much? <laughs> <laughs> probably more than you would think. Uh, at the same time, there's also, I'd say, what, what matters is the overall allocations to real estate as well. And what we are seeing now with rates normalizing, hopefully beginning to decline, a renewed interest in real estate outside of office, mm. right, as an alternative for credit and yield strategies. Mm. So we're seeing some of that capital come back in to complement, um, you know, the holdings in office. You operate in 27 cities around the world. Where exactly are you seeing strength? And where are you seeing weakness in the U.S. and outside the U.S.? Yeah. So one comment I'd make globally is that we see strength in Asia. Uh, we don't invest heavily into China, but we do in other markets, Japan in particular. And so some of the what we've been talking about in office, for example, this conversation is not relevant the same way in Japan and in Asia. Mm. Uh, so we see um, opportunity and momentum there. And then I'd say in North America and in the U.S. in particular, there are some markets, what we try to do is just, obviously you're trying to be predictive. Where do we expect population growth to be? Where do we expect job growth to be? So we are looking at markets that are both the anchors, a New York, absolutely a market that we are figuring out how to, you know, we want to invest mm -hmm. into at this point in the cycle, and then complementing that with growth markets. So some of the markets we think are compelling for industrial, for residential, markets like Atlanta, um, you know, the Virginia market, Charlotte, they're, they're seeing a lot of um, Anything good south. demand. <laughs> well, <laughs> not too far US. south, but yes. Can I ask you something, though? When you talk about um, office properties and concerns, Class A too, or is Class A still okay? Because we keep hearing that from everybody, like, Class A is fine, it's the other stuff. Yes, excellent point. It is absolutely the, the winners and the losers. So even beyond Class A, what I'd say is the highest quality, the best amenitized office, very strong demand. And if you, if you, one statistic I'll share is that if you look at buildings that have been built just in the last 10 years as mm. one metric of quality, there's positive net absorption, i.e. Mm. more demand mm. for that space in the last three or four years. Now everything else built before that, negative net absorption by a multiple. So you really see that in what tenants are looking for in terms of making occupancy decisions today. 
So that reminds me of industrial, actually, because one of the niche sectors that BGO likes is industrial, and in yes. part because 70% of it just does not really fit our lifestyle anymore. Exactly. Talk to us about building that up and those investments that you're making in that space that you favor. And we yeah. have about a minute left. Okay. <laughs> so uh, industrial, and more specifically, I'll touch on cold storage as one component of an industrial strategy because it exemplifies this well. What we look for is, one, where are there those secular shifts, right? So e-commerce, technology, robotics, automation, this is transforming the way real estate is a critical piece of the supply chain in the delivery of those goods. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the barriers to entry, if you will, right? And, and d d d the opportunity to kind of develop a high quality building, a modern building that's distinct from what was built you know, 20 years ago and mm -hmm. is really not meeting the demands of tenants today. Um, so, for example, ceiling heights, you know, there's physical characteristics that you can't, um, you know, renovate, you have to build. Come back, yes. both of you. I'd love to continue this conversation. Really cool insight. Um, Amy Price, president of BGO, and of course, our Abigail Doolittle, markets correspondent here at Bloomberg News. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Got to get to one of the big market stories today, and that is the semi space. Yeah, taking a look at the socks right now, it's uh, down more than 5%. Um, a cloud hanging over the industry. You got ASML shares plunging the most in more than 25 years. It booked only half the orders analysts expected in the third quarter. It lowered guidance for 2025. And NVIDIA shares also falling today after reaching a record yesterday. Biden administration officials have discussed capping sales of advanced AI chips from NVIDIA and other American companies on a country-specific basis. People familiar with the matter telling our own Mackenzie Hawkins, Bloomberg News, U.S. economic and industrial policy reporter. She joins us from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Ian King is also joining us. He's Bloomberg News U.S. semiconductor and networking reporter. He joins us from our San Francisco Bureau. Ian, the NVIDIA story is certainly a big one, but when you think of the entire chip sector, also reacting to the news that we got mid-morning New York time from ASML, shares plunging today. What's the signal that they sent? Yeah, I mean, orders are obviously an indicator of future revenue. Uh, and what they said was, we're getting a, less, a lot less in the future than you guys have been expecting. And that was not welcome news. It was done in a haphazard way. The report was published by mistake ahead of time. So caused basically a, a panic. And, and you've got to remember that this company is very much a, a leading indicator. What it's selling to the world is something which tells us something about what people feel about what's going to happen perhaps next year. Hey, is it though, Ian, all about Intel, which is one of its biggest customers? Is that where the, the problem is? Yeah, I mean, obviously they're not going to name specific customers uh, mm -hmm. and call them out, particularly if things are bad for them. But, you know, passing through the numbers, it's, it's hard to go past the fact that this is probably at least partially Intel's uh, doing, that Intel, as you know, and uh, is going to spend a lot less money on plants and equipment because it can't afford to. And that has a real, you know, huge impact on, on a company like ASML and the chip equipment sector in general. Ian, one more for you, and then we want to bring in Mackenzie on her NVIDIA scoop from earlier today. Um, when you think about where ASML is in the semiconductor uh, manufacturing process in the universe with these huge, incredible machines, what are the other companies we need to be watching as a result of the news we got from ASML today? Yeah, I mean, we, that's a good question. We've seen that happen already. We've seen applied materials trade off. We've seen KLA 10 core trade off. Um, we've also seen LAM research get hit, and we should probably look out for when Asia opens, what's going to happen to Tokyo Electron. These are all companies that are key suppliers of this technology. As we should point out, 28 names in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index are lower today, only two um, uh, to the upside. Mackenzie Hawkins, come on in on your scoop here. What do we know? What are the What's the Biden administration um, seriously considering? So for the past two years since the U.S. first implemented sweeping export controls on advanced semiconductors, a lot of the focus has been on China. 
And around a year ago, the U.S. actually added trade restrictions to more than 40 additional countries because of concerns that if NVIDIA or AMD or some other AI chip maker sent those chips to places like the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia, they could somehow wind up in Beijing's hands. But over the past couple of months in particular, Biden administration officials has been looking at a range of other national security risks specific to these regions in the Middle East, Central and Southeast Asia, and parts of North Africa. Things like human rights and surveillance concerns, counterintelligence risks to U.S. intelligence personnel around the world. And they're beginning to think, you know, how high volume shipments or how high a volume shipments should we allow NVIDIA and other AI chip makers to send to these countries to let them stand up their own AI infrastructure? So the latest development is that they're considering capping the total volume of sales that NVIDIA and its rivals would be able to ship to places like countries in the Persian Gulf. Are there ways that uh, countries and companies that operate in these countries can get around restrictions such as these by using compute power in other parts of the world? So these countries are actually trying to stand up massive amounts of compute power themselves. Of course, an AI company can train its models on data centers that aren't located physically next door. But a big part of the Middle East AI push is to actually stand up these data centers. And so they're desperate to import chips from NVIDIA, which is the far and away uh, industry standard, the gold standard, and several generations ahead of any offerings from China. Um, But the U.S. government is not wholesale blocking the sales of these chips. They're saying, okay, you can have these chips so long as you meet certain security requirements of ours in the licensing process. And all of the licenses together won't add up to more than a threshold that we'll have to wait and see if they are able to determine. You know, Ian, it makes me wonder, you know, what about just kind of believing in capital markets, letting companies do what they need to do? I know we've talked a million times with you about national security concerns when it comes to high-tech companies, particularly some of these semiconductors. But I wonder how crippling this could be ultimately for a company like NVIDIA if at the same time as you guys write in this story or this, as Mackenzie's story, and I know um, you also worked or gave some input, you know, you've got China and other companies looking to figure out their own NVIDIA. Yeah, I mean, this is the argument that the companies push back with, which is, look, if you don't allow us to supply them, if you don't allow us that window into what they're doing, A, that hurts your visibility, but B, it doubles their incentive to try harder and and to get equivalent products. Um, For now, as Mackenzie just said, NVIDIA is is over the horizon in the lead in this particular area, but it keeps cautioning and it keeps telling everybody, including in the White House, look, you need to be aware of the fact that we are giving them an incentive to catch up. Mackenzie, what's the next bit of this story that our investing audience needs to understand or needs to watch out for? What are you looking out for? So the big thing is after months of the Biden administration basically slow walking NVIDIA and other AI chip licenses to countries in the Middle East and elsewhere, but with a primary focus on the Gulf, we're going to be waiting to see whether any of these massive data center licenses are approved. Um, A great example to watch out for is Microsoft's partnership with G42, which is the top AI company in the UAE. Microsoft is investing a billion and a half dollars. They want to stand up data centers in the UAE and in Kenya, but that's all contingent on getting this license application approval from the U.S. government. Um, And that's one of many licenses that's been held up over the past couple of months. So we'll be waiting to see if that one comes through. Mackenzie, can we make an assumption that this is a Biden administration policy that this could potentially carry over if there is a Kamala Harris in the White House? Just got about 25 seconds. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks that these chip restrictions are going away, so that's probably a safe bet. All right, going to leave it there. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, Mackenzie Hawkins, U.S. Economic and Industrial Policy Reporter at Bloomberg News. Check out our scoop. You can find it on the Bloomberg Terminal and at Bloomberg.com. And, of course, always Ian King, U.S. Semiconductor and Networking Reporter at Bloomberg News out there in our San Francisco Bureau. The Sox, though, um, definitely underperformance in today's session. Tim, still down about 5.5%. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. How about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive, you crazy. It's the question that drives us. You drive me crazy. This is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio.
All right, everybody, we've got 18 minutes to go until we wrap up this uh, trading day on this Tuesday, October 15th. Carol Master along with Tim Stanovic live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. And as Charlie mentioned, as Bill Maloney mentioned, we are seeing stocks uh, hovering near their lows of the session. Um, taking a look at Trump Media, uh, that stock too is down in today's uh, session. I'm just bringing it since we did see our John Micklethwaite have an in-depth conversation uh, from the Chicago Economic Club with uh, the former president talking about a lot of different policies mm -hmm. and we do see Trump media down about 14% so hovering near its lows of the days yeah well. interesting yeah. Um, share slid as much as 12% well that was an earlier article um, it re uh, raised it was down 16% its gain. lows today yeah. wow yeah. and it was briefly halted for volatility yeah okay. so just interesting just uh, on the backdrop of that conversation yeah. I bring it up and that's why it is uh, relevant let's talk the market yeah let's see what uh, Jason Bronchetti has to say Chief Investment Officer at Lincoln Financial joining us from Pennsylvania. Um, Jason, good to have you with us this afternoon. How are you watching things? I mean, we hit a new record yesterday for the S&P 500. Um, we're nope. seeing uh, chip stocks really weigh on the trade today. A couple different stories out about that. We talked about that throughout our program. What's the view from your perch? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on with you again. It's great to be back with you. And I think, you know, as we think about the market, I mean, today's today's a choppy day. But the last time I was with you, we were talking a lot about the, the economy and the market backdrop and kind of where we might be headed. And I think there was a fair amount of debate at the time as to, you know, whether we were going to be in a soft landing or a hard landing, no landing, and what that might mean for markets. And I think if we take a step back and think about where we are today, you know, it looks like we're in this kind of soft landing category, at least for the moment. Growth is, is still positive, clearly, you know, Q Q2 GDP coming in over 3%. Q3 is looking about the same. Inflation is, is approaching trend and employment remains pretty healthy. So I think earnings uh, are in focus, obviously, uh, this week and last week. The banks setting a healthy tone. So I think the economic backdrop uh, is looking pretty good. Now we're bound to see some volatility. And that's one of the top things that we've been talking about with folks, particularly as we head into the uh, the election here and as the Fed kicks off and continues its, uh, its easing cycle. Hey, Jason, you bring up uh, the election. Former President Donald Trump saying his policies would inspire growth despite adding to the debt as he sought to assuage business leaders who worry his economic plans will fuel inflation. He says we're all about growth. He told that to Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite earlier today in an interview at the Economic Club of Chicago. He says yep. we're going to bring companies back to our country. Um, is there a Trump factor, though, in the trade? And here we are pretty much just hovering near our lows of the day. Is there some nervousness among investors about what a second term by Donald Trump might be. You know, I think I think anytime you're in the in the throes of a presidential election cycle, you're going to see volatility. And that's what we've seen. If you look back in history, markets tend to be pretty volatile uh, during election years leading up to uh, the actual presidential election and, and the outcome there. Uh, that being said, what we have seen is that once we get through that, markets tend to be less concerned about the about the political situation as some of that that cloud lifts. So whether it's a whether it's concerned about Trump or it's concerned about um, or whether it's concerned about Harris or what those policies might be, I do think you're right that that's weighing on things, and we would expect to see that volatility and perhaps heightened volatility even up for the next few weeks. But once we get through that, what we've seen historically uh, is really that in in you know all but uh, four of the last 24 elections going back to the 1930s, you saw positive returns for the equity markets during presidential election years. And the years in which three of those where we didn't have positive returns were, were those that were marked by crisis in 1932, 2000, 2008. So what I'd say is I'd expect yeah. to see more volatility for whatever reason, but but once you get through that, wouldn't be surprised to th see things firm up as we move it, move forward from there. Hey, there's, you know, candidates on a campaign trail, and then there's, you know, a president in the White House, and then there's also the Congress that goes along with it, whether or not it's of the same party or of a different party, determines what policies ultimately get, to, get done. How do you, like, who's better for investors? What president come November come January is better for investors, in your view. Yeah, I mean, we all have our views, but the reality is if you look back through history and you look at the, you know, the 10 year annualized performance in the S&P 500 post an election year, whether a Democrat wins or a Republican wins, the returns have been about the same, about 11.2% about annually for, for when a Democrat wins, about 10 and a half when a Republican wins. And that's been the case since World War II. So I think that while we care a lot about politics and we care about the markets, uh, notably near term, I think you're gonna see volatility around that. 
Um, but when you have the likelihood of, of some degree of divided government, the hard policy shifts are, are certainly less likely. And I think that that's more than likely the, the outcome in this case, that regardless of who wins, uh, the, clouds will, the clouds will lift and, and we'll see pretty positive returns over the long term. And so focus on you know, zooming back out, widening the aperture and being less focused on any given trade and more focused on what markets have done over the long term. We're just focused on you like every other person out there who's focused on the <laughs> folks who live in a swing state, right. Jason, because there you go. you're like the most Pennsylvania. important. Pennsylvania, we're in the hot, we're in the hotbed. <laughs> yeah, every, every four years this happens to you, right? Where it's like you turn on the Absolutely. TV and every other ad. I, I did go to Georgia back in August, Carol, and, and you know, watched a little local tele. Actually, I watched, I watched. Uh, I love national, watching local TV. Yeah, local TV, oh. national TV. <laughs> um, I couldn't get away from the ads. Every other ad was for a political candidate. I bet, Swing right? state, yeah, big money it. being spent. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. right? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, ju I just, I get what you're saying about like historically what happens obviously in election years and coming after it. But when you do have, you know, potentially a candidate who talks about increasing dramatically tariffs on foreign goods, doesn't that, doesn't, you're a smart guy, like tariffs, like don't, doesn't that make you a little concerned potentially? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that I think it's, it's an all out it's trade inflation. war, right, would not be great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any any kind of any kind of upheaval in that regard is, is certainly has the potential to be quite negative and or or stoke that inflationary impulse as well. I mean, I think when you look at what the what the Fed has done, uh, we've gotten to a pretty good place in terms of the trajectory around inflation. I think any policies like that that, that would be inflationary um, certainly should should give some some cause for concern as, as far as that goes. And at the same point, both seem to talk about a lot of spending, right? And you worry about the deficit. That's what I wonder is, I, I wonder yeah. also yeah. what I mean, look, the bond no, market lets them do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, no, nobody's really talking seriously about reining in any degree of fiscal spending. And so I think when we think about the short end of the curve, you're likely to see rates come down in the front end, uh, just given the, the direction of travel with the Fed. And I think that direction is clear and the pace and the destination are a little bit uncertain, but the policies out there, and regardless of who wins, uh, probably have the potential to be a little bit more long-term inflationary. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my friend Henrik Vey talks about we've been in this this marketplace and this economic backdrop of 30 years of benign globalization, inflation coming down, interest rates going lower. I think when you think about the amount of debt that's out there and some of the, the policy ideas that are being floated, certainly have the, the possibility of, of stoking that inflationary impulse and leading longer rates higher over the longer term. All right, good stuff. Fun to check in with you. Jason Burchetti, he's Chief Investment Officer at Lincoln Financial, joining us from Philadelphia. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.